Lovely minutes. stuff. Ten minutes, don't worry, I'll stick. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So it was, um, it was it a thousand, a, a thousand on Monday morning? Uh, I, I think we've, we've whittled down to the hardcore. But I'm quite impressed by it. There's still got to be a good 500 people. Um, so uh, I think here to see Disney, not to see me, um, <laughs> sadly. Uh, so I'm, I'm here to uh, uh, take you through uh, the highlights um, of our latest piece of research that we launched uh, a few weeks ago at uh, a full house in, in BAFTA. Uh, it's called BVOD Almighty Reach and Return, uh, and we think it's, the, it's probably the most comprehensive exploration of, of broadcast of VOD. Uh, and its role in, uh, on the media plan uh, to date. It was conducted in collaboration with the broadcasters, uh, so we worked directly with, with ITV, with Channel 4 and with Sky, um, partly because we needed to. We needed to get access to their raw ad server data, uh, and we needed all the NDAs signed and completed in order to, uh, for us to, uh, to get that data and to um, put it into the research machine. Uh, but also we wanted to, uh, to use their expertise. They're incredibly close to the world of broadcaster VOD. They understand it better than anyone else uh, and we, we used their advice to help shape the brief and, and write the objectives for this piece of work. Um, so let's, let, let's start by just sort of recapping on uh, where Broadcast the VOD is as a, as a channel within its own right. Uh, so in terms of the amount of viewing it accounts for, it's about 6% of all viewing uh, out of all video, which may seem like a, a, a small number, but you You've got to remember, we watch about five hours of video uh, a week. So that's on, on average. We're, we're talking about a couple of hours of broadcast of VOD viewing per week. Uh, in terms of revenue, uh, it's forecast to be just over £800 million uh, pounds this year. Uh, and so that puts it on a similar sort of size to, to the likes of radio. So it's a, it's a significant channel. Um, and it's predicted to grow. It's, uh, it's been growing for the last 10 or so years. Uh, and again, despite we are heading into uncertain times, we're predicted to see sort of just under 10% growth going next year. But despite having come to this point in time, uh, there's still relatively little known about broadcaster VOD. Uh, there's still areas that we've yet to really uncover, partly because campaign performance hasn't been measured by Barb in the same way that linear TV has. Uh, so advertisers, buyers don't get to explore the data in the same way. Also, from an econometric point of view, it's, it's, it's planned it's, uh, alongside Linear TV, and it's been hard to separate out the role that Broadcaster VOD plays from Linear TV. So we wanted um, really to do a piece of research that was going to help answer some of these questions that we were getting. Um, we've been... Uh, oh, it's not supposed to look like that, by the way. Anyway, my presentation's gone weird. Uh, well, just, just, just go with me. Um, uh, so we've been getting uh, lots of questions uh, that we haven't really been able to answer. So what is, uh, what, what is the role for how, you, how do you plan broadcast of VOD most effectively alongside linear TV? Um, uh, does it provide incremental reach to linear TV campaigns? Uh, and can we justify the higher cost per thousand uh, that you pay for broadcast of VOD relative to a broad audience on linear TV? Uh, so in order to answer these questions, um, we worked with uh, Acacia Avenue, who are a qualitative, quantitative research agency, um, uh, and w for their part, we wanted really to understand the environmental uh, aspects of broadcast of VOD uh, alongside the other video formats that are, are available. Um, with Game Theory and Group M, we wanted to do econometric analysis uh, of their data set. So they've got, they're sitting on a data bank of about a billion uh, of media investment that's been assessed through market mix modeling. Uh, and we wanted to use that data bank to help inform us on uh, the relative roles for broadcast of VOD on the plan for different types of category, uh, different types of business, dependent upon the, their roles, their objective. Um, and then we also wanted to understand um, how broadcast of VOD was working alongside linear TV from a reach point of view. Uh, so we worked with PwC where we, uh, we gave them uh, access to the sea flight data uh, and they were able to ingest over a thousand campaigns uh, and look at the, the different aspects of those campaigns in how they were delivered via broadcast of VOD that led to delivering incremental reach for advertisers. What are the components? How do we plan broadcast of VOD in order to drive that, uh, that reach? Uh, so uh, it, there's a lot of, uh, of research that's, that's gone into this, and it's not possible to sort of get across all the findings in, in 10 minutes. Uh, but I, I really wanted to sort of, in the main, go into some of the environmental aspects, some of the qualitative research, because that is the more sort of broader, bigger picture aspect of the, uh, of the findings. So uh, let's um, talk about what we did. Uh, it was a uh, videographic, ethnographic piece of work where we, um, uh, we spoke to 20 people and we explored their video viewing habits 
over a, a period of time and we got them to really pay attention to the advertising that they were seeing. Uh, we also used the likes of these, uh, the glasses, the video glasses that record so we could see what they were seeing and what they were doing. Uh, and then we could go back to more sort of in-depth uh, type of interviews where we're talking to them about past video viewing experiences uh, and we can understand uh, the, the, the actual uh, reaction to the advertising and how they, what they got from the advertising. Uh, and in summary, there was, uh, there was a, a number of things that came through. Um, but I think, you know, th this week we've spent a lot of time talking about uh, how we define TV. Um, and uh, what does that mean? Uh, for a, and from a viewer's point of view, they don't really care that much about how TV is defined. But what's really interesting, from, from an advertiser's point of view, you probably really do care uh, about how TV viewing is perceived by viewers and, and the impact, the implicit impact that that has on the way that advertising, uh, advertising is, is actually received and interpreted uh, by the viewers. Uh, we found there were sort of three distinct areas that had an impact on the way that advertising uh, was received across different video formats. Uh, there were content signals, which was the signals that were delivered via the actual device that uh, the video was being viewed on. Um, the, uh, um, uh, sorry, the, the actual content that's being played. So how high quality is the content? How old? How new it is? Uh, there was device signals, which is the signals delivered by the device. And then there were ad signals by the, the ad itself, the actual creative quality, uh, the nature of the creative, the type of advertising that delivered these implicit signals, which all impact uh, quite significantly on how the advertising is taken out. Uh, so I've got a video which, fingers crossed, is going to play for you now, which gives you some of the highlights, some of the stuff that we were finding out from our respondents. You've got me. You know, you've got me. You've got my time. You've got my attention. You know, I'm here. You know, I don't have control. You do. It feels fine because I've got the time. I've committed. I think that's, you know, and I'm, I'm happy to go through that. In terms of me watching the advert, put it on catch up because that's where you're going to catch me. That's where I'm going to, I'm more likely to watch it. I like to be comfortable when I'm watching something. I mean, if I'm out and about, it's, I'm, I'm doing something. So I'm not really focused on what I'm watching. But when I'm at home, at least I can have a cup of tea, I can have something sweet, I could be in my vest and I could be in whatever I'm wearing and I could just watch, watch it comfortably. <laughs> TikTok for me, it's all about scrolling and I'm not there to see the ad. And because it's on a small device like the phone, I don't pay any attention versus like the TV because it's kind of like in front of you, it's, it's on a larger screen, it's in your face. But on the phone, I think you have more control. It's like I'm going to skip it straight away. I do feel like it is a specifically like a mainstream TV thing where you do have those adverts like the John Lewis ones. In a way, it's part of like a, like a collective experience in that yeah. everyone watching it at that point is having the same emotion probably, whereas because it's not targeted, it's just here is something that en masse will probably make people feel a certain way. Enjoy a freshly prepared 99p mayo chicken, part of the McDonald's sailor menu. <laughs> <laughs> I can remember vividly being in exactly the same situation. Those little things remind you that you're not alone and that, that there are people out there. And for somebody to have come up with that idea of accidentally <laughs> pressing the horn, I find that quite amusing. Who doesn't love watching telly in their vest and knickers? Come on, it's the, it's the way it should be done. Um, so uh, 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 there was just uh, there was lots that was coming through um, where the implicit impact of the advertising and, and where it was being watched really really impacted on how that message was uh, was interpreted how it was absorbed the the effectiveness of that advertising uh, so w we saw things like the the value exchange really come into play uh, where there's a, there's a an understood and accepted value exchange between TV content and advertising. Um, and it comes from years of, uh, of linear TV and the nature of how that works. Uh, and where, where that value exchange falls down, where it's not good enough, then advertising is actively avoided, it's, it's ignored. There's also a, a real importance in the way that advertising sits within content. Uh, uh, so when there's ads that are disguised as content, it's hugely frustrating. Uh, and this is a common problem with TikTok, TikTok at the moment, where people will be using, looking through TikTok, and they'll get to an ad, not realize it's an ad, then realize it's an ad, and be frustrated by it. Uh, there's an issue with the actual, the nature of where ad breaks are taken and how they're taken. Uh, when, when ads are just put in the middle of content, uh, um, without any clue, without any normal creation, uh, it really jars. 
Um, and so th th a lot of the costly signals that are delivered by TV advertising come from the format, the nature of how it's delivered, um, and the impact that has. There's also something really interesting coming through about the, the shared screen. Uh, and because it's a shared screen, it's assumed that the advertising isn't targeted. Obviously, as we've seen, more often it is. It can be targeted now. Uh, but the fact is that the advertising isn't expected to be, uh, to be targeted. Uh, and therefore, any type of category has permission to advertise. It's not being scrutinized by the viewers. Uh, whereas advertising on devices is expected to be targeted. Viewers expect uh, that advertisers are going to be targeting to them. Uh, and when they get it wrong, it's frustrating and it's annoying. They're thinking, why am I being served this ad? Why am I seeing this ad? Uh, it's evaluated and therefore it becomes less effective. Um, and we found really what mattered most of all uh, is that if you can make great creative that, that resonates, uh, that actually completely overpowers any need for, for relevance, uh, which allows TV to play across all categories to people who are in market and people who are out of market. And that's one of the essence of TV that makes it such a powerful brand builder, but also a powerful sales tool for all types of business. Uh, right, I'm out of time. I was talking too much. Um, there's two other things to very quickly touch on. Uh, it's difficult to see on this chart. It shouldn't look like that. Um, uh, but um, we've got uh, econometric uh, evidence that shows that broadcast of VOD does deliver effectiveness in the short term and the long term. It works about the same alongside linear TV in terms of its, uh, its relative efficiency. The numbers at the bottom that you can't really see are probably the most important ones because I talk about the scale uh, that it's able to deliver. Um, and that's why you see linear TV come into it on its own. It delivers a high return, but at scale, which means it can draw a high volume of profit. Um, and then we also came up with um, a number of uh, uh, of uh, uh, areas from a planning point of view, how you can uh, be effective with your broadcast of VOD planning. Some of them are things that we probably knew already uh, and were already doing, but it's nice to have it proven through uh, significant volumes of data, and that is that you should be buying across all sales points, you could, should be buying across all genres, you should be spreading uh, your inventory as wide as possible. Um, one thing that we weren't necessarily expecting was that uh, it's very important to plan broadcast of VOD across longer periods of time because VOD builds, uh, re the reach of VOD builds slower than that of linear TV. Um, and so rather than map it against your linear campaign, uh, you should try and um, map it across a longer period of time, and that's going to give you the best chance of, of getting to those lighter viewers. Uh, but um, I won't go through the summary, uh, but yeah, go to the website at thinkbox.tv, uh, and you can get the full debrief there. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks,